I hope and trust everybody had a, a good week, a blessed week. Isn't it exciting to be in the house of the Lord? Yeah. One thing I discovered this week is I'm not as young as I used to be. <laughs> there was an incident, and I had to go over a six-foot wall and uh, to check on a family that wasn't answering their door and was doing a well check. And I discovered I'm not as young as I thought. <laughs> and I think I bruised or broke a rib because it's really hurting today. So, but, you know, God is still good, huh? All the time. And all the time? God is good. Oh, I love it. You know, as I was thinking this week, I, I was reminded of a, it was a husband and wife, and they started trying to teach their children Bible verses. Sounds like an awesome thing, huh? Teach our children young. And as they were doing that, uh, they would re read one verse each week, and they would write it down and put it on cards and set it on the, the kitchen table, and they would try to recite it many times throughout that week. And then one evening, him and his wife were sitting there watching TV, and they heard the, the two kids in the back room fussing at each other like kids do, huh? And one of them says, I hate you. So dad kind of listened, and he thought, well, I don't want to really get involved in this just yet. But he yelled out to the oldest one and said, um, do you remember what our verse is for this week? And that young child thought for a moment and then responded back. Well, and her, her voice was kind of uh, just kind of mean and ornery at the same time. And she said, Dear friends, since God loved us as much as that, as, as that, we surely ought to love each other too. And she quoted 1 John chapter 4, verse 11. That was her response. But then right after, she went right back to fighting with her sibling. <laughs> so mom and dad kind of thought for a second, so they yelled out to the youngest one and ended up getting the same results. So they kind of laughed at first, but then they had to go back in the back of the house and kind of intervene. But isn't that a beautiful example, if you will, of how most apply Scripture today? And we memorize it and we repeat it sometimes even flawlessly, huh? But seldom does it change our lives. And, and yet Christianity is not so much about knowing facts about living, but we must get the Bible off the shelf and get it into ourselves. Huh? And, you know, I was thinking, too, I thought, you know, it's so often you'll hear stories like this where suppose, you know, it was like the young couple, they have a, a good night's sleep and they wake up in the morning and the husband, he wakes up and he walks over and he looks at the dresser and on the dresser is a big mirror. And when he looks at the, the, the mirror there, he sees his reflection and he becomes very angry because his hair is disheveled. Obviously, I'm not talking about me because mine's not there. Huh? <laughs> but his hair is kind of disheveled, and he's got the, the sleep mark on the side of his face, and he doesn't like what he sees, so he grabs the, her hairbrush, and he starts pounding it on the counter or the dresser, and he's all upset. And his wife says, what, what, why are you doing this? And he tells her that he could not stand the reflection of that mirror. Now, that would be kind of ridiculous, huh, to judge that mirror for his own reflection, <laughs> right? But <clears throat> so often people act like that, as Brother Dennis just read, we just saw a piece of that in the scripture there, huh, where we have something, and, and it was a few years back, I was, I was teaching on this in a Bible study, and I started to walk in and have a black mark going all the way down the side of my face, and see how many people would point it out, and then they'd show me in a mirror, and I'd, yeah, okay, and just keep on going, right? To, to really hammer this point home, because we do this so often in our lives. Anybody here ever done that before? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> <laughs> now, in James chapter 1, verse 21 through 27, we see some really great things. And the Bible, the Bible is so full of great truths, it's amazing, isn't it? But these truths, even if we know them, and you've read them, and you know them, they do us absolutely, absolutely no good if we do not receive them. 
someone may know the plan of salvation and still not be saved. Here's one that I can talk about real quick. Satan knows the plan of salvation, huh? But he's not saved. Maybe you've got some friends or relatives and you've shared the plan of salvation with them. They know the plan of salvation. Maybe someone has came here before, or even here today, has heard it, hopefully in these last couple of weeks that I've been here, you've heard the plan of salvation. But do you really know it? Because I have seen folks, and Dennis and I were talking about this a couple of weeks back, where I've seen Sunday school teachers and even a deacon that was 20 years in the ministry and, and doing things, one day gave his life to Christ at the end of a service. You just never know, huh? It's between them and God, but what I'm, my point is, some may know the plan of salvation, but they still haven't accepted the Lord as their Savior, and they're not saved. We are not saved by the plan of salvation, right? We are saved by the man, Jesus Christ, Amen. right? And, and there are many people who know, they know theology, but they have never received the truth. It is one thing to know the facts about Jesus. It's another thing to know the Lord Jesus. Because I've seen a lot of folks, man, they can come in and they can they nail the theology. But then you look at them and really get into the heart of the discussion. Sometimes they don't know the Lord. It is one thing to hear the Word of God. It is quite another thing to welcome the Word. To receive the Word. And the book of James uh, was written to those of... They've already been saved. When you look at what James, who he's talking to, <clears throat> these folks have already been saved. And he was talking to the 12 tribes that were kind of scattered abroad. And so the question comes to bear, why does James 1.21 refer to the need to be saved when the audience has already been saved? Well, when you think of this, salvation, if you will, is in three tenses. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we shall be saved. Okay? There is no contradiction between these three uh, things of salvation. All three truths are there. As a Christian, as Christians, all of us, we have been saved in the past, right? When we receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, correct? Okay, we are saved from the penalty of sin, right? It, <clears throat> we are being saved currently of the power of sin. Praise God for that, huh? And we shall be saved when we go to heaven from the possibility of sin. Because there's not going to be sin there in heaven. Isn't salvation amazing? And we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Sanctification, salvation, sanctification, and all those things. But here in James uh, 1 21, James is not talking about going to heaven one day when he mentions receiving the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. This is referring to receiving the word of God that is able to deliver our psyche. And, and the Greek word for soul is psyche. And that is, that it encompasses our mind, our emotion, and our will. The Word of God is able to sanctify each and every one of us. That is something that's awesome, huh? To know that the Word of God can do that. James here is not talking primarily about having our sins forgiven in the past or going to heaven in the future, but he's stating that the Word of God, the Word of God is able to give us deliverance from the power and the pollution of sin right now. That ought to get your excitement meter up there, huh? Amen. To save our mind, emotion, and will. And you can read more about this if you go into the book of Psalm and go to chapter 19 go and read seven, uh, verse 7 through 11 in that area. You'll, you'll see more about this. But there is power. There is power in the Word of God, huh? And you can always go to Acts chapter 1 and see that, huh? There is power. Remember I said last week that power that the Bible is talking about is like dynamite, huh? 
That's awesome power. There is power in the Word of God. In order to be victorious in our Christian lives, folks, we got to stay in the Bible. We got to stay in the Bible. And I, I've seen some folks like this where, you know, they they come to church on Sunday and they got their Bible or you know now it's better because you have iPads, iPhones, and all these things, and you you, you have access to the scriptures all the time if you really want. But in the past, I would say, where's your Bible when I was doing a visit or something? And, well, I got to go find it, right? And they don't know where it's at. <clears throat> and then I've seen folks where their Bible, they left it in Sunday school. And then the next week, you say, hey, how was your devotions this week? Oh, they were good. Did you read any good scriptures? Oh, yeah. What were they? I, I, I don't remember. Well, here's your Bible, and then you see their face just turn red, right? And it's like, we got to stay in the Scriptures, though. Dust it off, carry it, know it, read it, and we have to do that. There's no way to be victorious apart from receiving the Word of God. And in James 1, verse 21, the Greek word for receive in the King James Version means to welcome to welcome. This word does not mean to reach out and take. We must open our hearts and welcome the Word of God. We must receive the Word of God as we receive a friend into our own house. And now think of this, if a friend's coming over to your house, what do you do? You tidy up a little bit, you clean up, right? Most of us, okay. You, you prepare, and you're wel you welcome them in. When they come through that door, hi, how are you doing? I haven't seen you. Like, when you come through the doors here at the church, you're, you're getting welcomed, right? Are we doing that with God's Word? Often not, huh? And today, I want to look at three ways to welcome the Word of God, because I think it's so, so important. And, and the first one I wrote down is coming out of James 1, 21 here. It's welcome the Word with repentance, we got to have repentance, huh? One of the first things we would do, like I said, when a guest was coming to our home for a visit would be to clean up the house. And the same is true spiritually, though, when you think about it. If we want the Word of God to dwell in us richly and abound unto all fruitfulness, we got to do this, huh? In James 1.21, the Greek word for filthiness is a medical term that refers to, get this, wax in your ear. Did you ever get wax in your ear? And I thought that was really interesting when I found that out and read that. I'm like, wow, wax in the ear. But if you have wax in the ear, what happens? It keeps you from hearing, huh? And when you see that in the scriptures, that filthiness is keeping us from hearing God's Word. Maybe it's a television program. Maybe it's the Internet. Maybe you know. You, you fill in the blank, whatever it might be. huh? But sometimes there are things in our spiritual ears that need to be removed so that we can hear and receive the Word of God. In the same passage here, the word uh, super, uh, fu uh, fluidity, it means that that which remains and that which is left over. Sometimes a person who was born again and has had sins forgiven may still struggle with a sin from an old life. Right? Let me give you an example. A man, he ends up... Uh, Say, I, got, you know, I used this uh, to some young guys when I was teaching them one time. And I said, okay, you know, uh, God forgives, but sometimes you still have that, that sin that's still in your life. And I, I gave an illustration. A man goes out and has an affair, and he ends up catching something. He goes to his wife. He confesses. He confesses to the Lord Jesus. He, he becomes clean again. He's saved from all that, right? But he still has to deal with that sin. And maybe it's, uh, maybe it's an addiction. Those don't just go away because we accepted Jesus Christ. Sometimes they do. God can deliver us, right? But not always. 
So sometimes they're still struggling, and they need Christians, brothers and sisters, to rally around them and to disciple them and show them God's Word and help them in those situations, huh? And so sometimes we're still struggling with a sin from the old life. Let me give you a biblical example of this. This can be found in the account of uh, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And if you, if you were to, you can write this down in your notes, John chapter 11, verse 44. And when you think of this, this is when Lazarus, he came forth, right? Remember he was wrapped up in the grave clothes in that story? He was wrapped up so he could hardly move. Just imagine Lazarus coming out like this, right? He's alive. He's coming out of that, that, that grave. But he had life, but he didn't have liberty, huh? He couldn't just run. So this superfluity of naughtiness may still be clinging to a Christian. And we need to get rid of that. We need to work on that, huh? In Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32, the prodigal son, remember that story? Here's the prodigal son. Remember where he was at? He was with the pigs and everything else, right? You think he smelt very good? His clothing wasn't clean, right? Here he is. He's coming in. He's wearing this old filthy clothes of the old life. And he comes in, and he had to lay those to the side, huh? And sometimes as Christians... We are still wearing the old, filthy, gray clothes. And, you know, and some are not, we're, if you're doing that, we're not ready to receive the Word of God if we're wearing unclean garments or have spiritual wax in our ears. So we need to address those things. That's why I said the first point was in repentance, to repent those things, right? So if we want the Bible to be alive to us, then we must be willing, you've got to be willing to repent of the filthiness, right, and, and that naughtiness. And think of this, one sin, no matter how small we may think that it might be, just one, what's it do? It opens the doors to other sins, huh? It opens the doors to other sins. So if we want to study the Bible, God's Word, and really, really, really understand it. I hope everybody here wants to do that, right? I hope so. Then we must lay aside all filthiness and naughtiness and receive the word with meekness, with meekness. And so we receive the word with repentance. We must also have a clean heart when we come about this, huh? <clears throat> the next thing was receive the word with readiness. That's the second point this morning. The word meekness, um, in the King James Version, it does say meekness there, is the, in this passage, it means a compliant spirit. A spirit that's ready to obey. Ready to obey. Many of us, when we study the Word of God, sometimes don't get anything out of it, huh? because we don't have a meek spirit. And meekness, understand this, is not weakness. It is not. That word gets thrown around a lot and people think, well, if you're meek, that you're weak. Is that true? Absolutely not. Huh? Meekness is not weakness. Think of this, Moses, in the book of Numbers, first, uh, chapter 12, verse 3, we read how Moses was the most meek man, right? Now think about Moses, though. Who was he? He was also a commander in the, ch he was a commander in chief of one of the greatest armies. Now, would he be meek in the other sense of the word, right? No. Meekness also means this meekness means that you are teachable. You, are, you have trainability and controllability. So I'll ask you this morning, are you teachable? Are you teachable? We've got to be meek to be, in order to be teachable, huh? Some people truly, truly don't understand the Word of God because, man, they parade around with what they read in the Bible, and they pass it through, if you will, their, the jury of their mind, and like, well, that's okay. And they try to make guilty or not guilty in their own minds, huh? 
and they try to explain away that sin. Remember I said a few weeks ago how we call sin different things? We try to... Sin is sin, though, right? But in today's society, over the years now, we try to come up with different names for sin and, and try to make it softer, not as insulting or whatnot. And I think sometimes people do that in their own minds with their own sin, and that's dangerous ground, huh? Rather than simply receiving the Word of God, they think that somehow... The Bible has to agree with them, and they'll try to twist the Scriptures. Some people do not welcome God's Word because of stubbornness. Can you think of anybody in the Scriptures that was very, very stubborn? Look at old King Pharaoh, huh? Very, very stubborn. We must receive God's Word, though, with meekness, and we must be broken and ready to do God's will. So often, you know, I, I, I was telling folks, you know, you got to get in God's Word, got to get in God's Word, and they try to get into it. No, they'll open it up and go, okay, the, the book of Revelation. And they'll start in chapter 1, verse 1, and they'll try to read all the book of Revelation in one setting. Are they getting anything out of that? Not a whole lot, probably, huh? Sometimes it's okay just to read one or two verses and dwell on that. That's why the book of Proverbs is so good, because it's in little bites. And if you look at the book of Proverbs, anybody know how many chapters is in the book? 31. 31, you're absolutely right. It's a great monthly devotional right there, huh? So you don't lose track of where, where am I? Well, today's the fifth. Well, I'm in the fifth book, right, or the fifth chapter. The next point is to receive the word with responsiveness. James uh, goes on to that too. If we do not respond to what we claim to have received and claim that we have welcomed in, then we are foolish and have deceived ourselves. We got time for this. I get those two minutes that we started late back, right? Okay. <laughs> if you flip over to Matthew... You go Matthew, Mark, right? So Matthew's the very first one. Go to chapter 7. And if you look at verse 26, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine, this is Jesus speaking, and does not do them, will be like a foolish man who has built his house on the sand. Oh boy, that ain't going to last long, right? Okay, so if we do not respond to what we claim that we have received and welcomed, then we, we are, God's Word is telling us we are foolish and deceive ourselves. Many people have become hearers of the Word without become doers of the Word. They hear it, they read it, maybe they watch it on TV, they, they come to church, whatever it might be. They hear God's Word week after week, or they read it, but they're not doing anything about it. Right? And I, I've seen this before that... Sometimes they'll have a notebook, and man, they are just full of sermon notes, but no intention to obeying what they've heard from the pulpit whatsoever. It has become more like a hobby, if you will, to some of them. They, they're taking the truth, but not responding to the truth. I had a brother in church that he would sit down, and, and when God's Word was being preached, he'd open it up like James today, he would take a highlighter or a pen, and he would mark all those verses. You look at his Bible now, it's all highlighted. But does he follow God's Word? I hope he does. I, I hope so. And, I, you know, I, my Bible, if you look at it, yes, I highlight, I mark, I write notes and stuff all over it. Because, you know, it's when God's talking to me, when I'm reading the Scriptures... Or if I'm doing an in-depth Bible study and I'm going, oh, wow, yeah, that goes with Matthew chapter 7, right? I'll, I'll put a note next to it. But that's, that's okay. Some people don't like to write in their Bibles. I understand that too. But in mine, yeah, there's marks in a lot of places. But I'm not just advertently just highlighting all over the place, right? And that's what some are doing. They'll have all this notebook. They'll have all these sermon notes and everything else, but they're not obeying they have no intention of obeying what they've heard what they've read and it's more like a hobby it's taking they're taking the truth but not responding to it whatsoever and that is a dangerous self-deception dangerous when someone is self-deceived 
he gets himself into a trap that is hard. Man, it is hard to get out of that, huh? And someone once said that we live by what we really believe. Are you with me? We live by what we really believe, and the rest is just religious talk. And, and to know whether or, or not we're receiving the Word of God, we can ask ourselves this question. This is a very important question. You might even want to write this one down. Is my knowledge of the Bible making me more like Jesus Christ? In James chapter 1, verse 23 and 24, we see where he was talking about just that, huh? About being, what's he saying there? For if anyone hear, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he was like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he is. Right? The word for behold in that passage is like a casual glance, if you will. This is a person who glances in the mirror for just a moment, and then that's it. That's all. Right? There's no, absolutely no change. He, he's glanced in the mirror for just a second, saw what he looked like, and then he just immediately forgot about it. Did you ever do that? I'm sure we have when we walk by a mirror, we go, hmm, okay, and we keep right on going. I'm not thinking about that anymore, right? Well, what about God's Word? Should we do that with God's Word? No. No. That's why it's good to have a daily devotion and, and read some verses and dwell, pray. On. You know, I was teaching a young adult class, and I said, you can do this in seven minutes a day or less or more, depending on what you want to do and how much you want to get into this. But I said, first, pray. Pray for a minute. Pray about what you're going to read. Ask God to reveal something and the Holy Spirit to reveal something. Ask God to help you understand it. Then read for maybe a minute. And then pray over it again. And then dwell on it. Reread it. And then pray again that God will enlighten you even more as that day goes on. And then throughout the day, think back on what you read that morning. And continue to dwell on those, that verse or those verses. It doesn't take an hour and a half to do that, right? And there's a reading plan right there. And it's simple, but you're saturating it in prayer and asking God to open your, your eyes and reveal what God's Word's saying to us. huh? And because, <clears throat> like I said, this is dangerous ground. It's dangerous ground when we do that. But we need to... Behold the word, which is more than just that casual glance. Because, see, with a casual glance, there is no change. There's no change in, our, in us at all. We just look at that mirror and just keep right on going. James 1.25 there, though, he talks about looking into. So it, in this passage, it means like a careful gaze. Now think of that, a careful gaze. That is the same word, when you look at the original language, it's the same word that we find in John chapter 20, verse 5. You'll remember this. The disciple John, remember when the open tomb, Mary was there, and, and, and they were running back, and they get there. What does the uh, disciple John do? He intently and steadfastly looked into that tomb, trying to see everything he could see. Huh? He didn't just walk in and look at the tomb. Yeah, it's empty. Right? No, he went in and just carefully started looking to see everything that he could possibly see. And this is how we are supposed to look into the Word of God. Because God's Word is alive and it's breathing, huh? And God's Word is given to us so that we can have a better understanding of Him and His love. And we can have a better life, huh? A steadfast, careful gaze and examination of the Word. And then, after an examination of the Word, an application of the Word. So you have that gaze where you're really looking into it. And then, after that, you're examining it even further. And then you're applying what you've learned. You've got to apply it. We need to look into the Word. We need to read it. We need to study it. And we need to scrutinize it, huh? And when we see what the Bible has to say to us, we 
we then we need to obey it and change our way of living. If you're reading something and God says, don't do this or do this, and you continue to do that or not do that, is that a sin? Think about it, right? If God's word says don't kill and you're a murderer, you better stop, huh? But if God's word explains that you look at a woman with adultery in her heart and you're still doing it, is that sin? Yes. So you've you got to understand those things, though, huh? And, but you can't just read something and go, yeah, I'm going to do that without reading the whole thing so you really get a, a good understanding of what God's word says. You don't want to read something where it's talking about Judas, how he went out and hung himself. And say, okay, I guess I got to go hang myself, right? You don't want to do that. You want to understand God's word. And then God's word becomes a blessing to each and every one of us huh, in our lives. There is also a great truth about Bible study. The way to understand the part of the Bible, how many of you really, really want to understand the Bible? All of us? Okay. So listen up. The way to really understand the part of the Bible we don't understand is to obey the part of the Bible that we do understand. I'm trying to say that as simple as possible, huh? And when God reveals something to us in His Word, we need to obey it. Isn't God's Word amazing? Sometimes you read it, and you go back six months later, and you read that same passage of Scripture, and you get so much out of it, huh? It's like when we, a, a Christian first becomes, a, a man or woman first becomes a Christian, what happens? They understand about it like this, huh? And as time goes on, and their faith grows, and their study grows, it's like God's opening up the veil, and they're understanding more and more and more and more, Right? That's where we need to be. We need to be opening our eyes more and more and more. We're not going to do that if we're not in God's Word, huh? We're only still going to see this. If I, you know, when I was working another job, when I was teaching and training there, if someone, I would demonstrate something, I'd have them read the policy and procedures and all that, and I'd demonstrate to them so they knew it. And then I'd ask them to, to demonstrate to me. But if they couldn't do it, then we'd have to go back again, right? I'm not going to show them even more when they can't get what they've already got. And I think that's what God, God's Word is doing to us. That's why we need to come with it. We need to repent, come with meekness and prayer and everything else. So understand it, obey it. When we obey what we've learned in the Bible, then we have welcomed the Bible. It all starts with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, though, huh? You got to have that. So, you know, I would ask everyone here, and those that are seeing this online later, do you know Jesus Christ personally as your Lord and Savior? Man, if not, you can, you can pray to Him anytime, anywhere. He's faithful and just to hear us, huh? And it cleanses. And we can just ask for him to come into our hearts to forgive us and to be our Lord and our Savior. Just call upon him, repent. And that repent is, that's another word, it just means turning. It's like making a U-turn. Living a sinful life, I'm going to repent. What am I going to do? I'm going to turn from that sinful life. I'm going to Christ, right? And repent, turn from those sins. And ask him to forgive you and to study the Bible with meekness and repentance. And, and get into it more and more each day. Because I'm telling you, we live in a sick and dying world right now. And there is so much chaos going on in, in, in the world. And then you bring it down to America. And you can bring it down to Nevada. huh? There's a lot going on with the pandemic, the riots, the protests. Crime rates, you name it, it's out there. People are struggling financially and everything else. You know what the answer is? Jesus. Amen. One thing I know, God is still on his throne. Amen. And God loves each and every one of us. And God gave us this word. My question to any Christian is, why are we not in it more? Especially in times like this, huh? especially in times like this. And I gave you a little sample of how you can do it 
in just a few minutes a day. And it was amazing because I had one gentleman, he, he was having all kinds of, he, I, I don't think I told you guys this story, but he was coming to church because he wanted to pick up a girl. Did I tell that story? Okay, I didn't think I did yet. He was coming to church because he wanted to pick up a girl. He was atheist. His girlfriend was Christian. So they came to church for several weeks, and I kept proclaiming God's Word, talking to them about Bible study, reading God's Word. I was challenging all those young adults to get into the Bible, right? Get into it. And one day, he came to church, and he was sitting there, and it was in the beginning of the class. He said, Terry, can I say something? I said, absolutely. And I'm thinking, man, I hope this is okay. <laughs> and then he says, you know, you challenged us a few weeks ago. You gave us a little blurb where we could, we could study God's Word in just a few minutes a day. And he goes, I tried. And he goes, but it just wasn't working. But he goes, you know, I, I work as an IT operator at home, working from home. So I decided to, to step it up even a little bit more. I said, what'd you do? Now he's telling all the people in the classroom this, right? He takes his Bible and he sets it in front of his computer each night. So in the morning when he gets up and gets his coffee, he goes in and sits down and gets ready to sign on. He's got to move that Bible before he can do anything, huh? So he would read, pray and read for seven minutes. And he goes, you know what I've learned in the scriptures this week? And I'm like, brother, tell me. And he started, he, the man, he ended up, he, was, he, he gave his life to Christ. He got baptized, joined the church, the whole nine yards, right? And stronger faith than his wife. And he, they ended up getting married. But it was unbelievable to see the power of God's word in that man's life. And that's just a few minutes a day. So that's why I said this book, this Bible, God's word is alive and it's for us. We need to get into it. And I hope today we've heard reasons why and how we can get into it even more to enrich our faith and just our life and our connection with God. He's an awesome God, and He loves each one of us. This morning, I'm going to have Brother Dennis come up and stand on one side, I'll stand on another, and as the music is played, if you've never given your life to Christ and like to do so, I ask you, just come. Come forward, tell one of us, and let us pray with you. And maybe you're going through some stuff, and you just need prayer. That's the time to come up and talk to us, too. Let us pray for you. And if... Uh, Today you decided, you know what, I'm going to start getting more and more into God's Word. And you want to pray over that too. Come up. Take this opportunity as the music is playing and come forward. Talk to one of us, okay?